Be careful what you wish for you just might get it. It's a phrase that we've all heard at least once in our lives. And if you're a smart ass, then you probably responded, good, that would be ideal actually. Thanks for the advice. But is it really a good thing to get everything you wish for, to force fate to dump everything you want right in your lap? I mean, it seems to work out in a lot of Disney movies. Aladdin and Pinocchio ended up with some pretty happy endings after they made their wishes. Granted, both of them had to drown before it worked out, but still, things were Gucci by the time those credits rolled. Today's story, however, paints wishing and wish fulfillment in a far more negative, dare I say, traumatizing light. The monkey's paw has been referenced referenced, reimagined, and straight up adapted across every medium you can think of. And while most people are familiar with the concept of a cursed monkey's paw thanks to pop culture, surprisingly few have heard the story that inspired it. That's why today, approximately 101 years and one month after the story was written, I'm going to share with you the chilling plotline that made it a staple of the spooky season and unpack the bizarre and kind of hilarious folklore that English author W.W. W. Jacobs may have used as inspiration. Remember to sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to the algorithm gods to get more messed up folklore, myths, and short stories in your sub box every Thursday. And without further ado, Our story opens on a rainy night in the English countryside. In a small house outside of town lived the White family. Mr. White, Mrs. White, and their son Herbert. On this particular evening, Mr. White and Herbert were playing chess to pass the time while they waited for a friend of Mr. White's to drop by. Mr. White, who is paying more attention to the time and weather than the game, watches himself get checkmated off a boneheaded maneuver, but before he can flip the board, he hears his front gate open and a knock at the door. In walks the man of the hour, Sergeant Major Morris. He had been serving in India for the past 21 years and was finally home for good, so he wanted to celebrate with his old friend. Mr. White poured the meat some whiskey and soon the men were enveloped in conversation about the strange adventures the sergeant had in the foreign land. They were having a great time catching up, joking and laughing like they did back in their youth. But the tone of the conversation became suddenly serious when Mr. White asked about the monkey's paw that his friend had mentioned when they ran into each other a few days prior. Just hearing the phrase monkey's paw was enough for Herbert and Mrs. White's ears to perk up. They asked the sergeant what a monkey's paw was, and he replied that it's a bit of what you might call magic. The sergeant reached into his jacket and set the trinket on the table. It was a truly disgusting sight to behold, but the family's morbid curiosity made them all the more interested. The sergeant explained that the paw was a cursed object, with a spell placed on it by an old mystic who wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives and that those who tried to change it would be sorry. The spell allowed for three different men to have three wishes from it each, and the sergeant was its second owner. For those wondering how the sergeant got his hands on the paw, you're not alone. Mr. White asked that same question question, and the sergeant replied that after the previous owner's first two wishes came true, he wished for death, and after he was gone, it was the sergeant's to take. We never learn what the sergeant wished for, but it's safe to assume that it didn't go well, because after he polishes off his whiskey, he throws the paw in the fire, insisting that it was way too dangerous for anyone in the White family to risk using. Despite the warning, Mr. White rushed over to the fire and saved the paw before any major damage could be done. The sergeant then advised him to throw it back in the fire like a sensible man, but added that if he does decide to use it, then he can't hold him responsible for the outcome. I would say that's a pretty fair warning for the sergeant to give. Like, Mr. White is a grown man, so the sergeant doesn't have a right to tell him that he can't use the tool that he was just going to throw away. Now that being said, if he really wanted to spare someone the pain, he could have destroyed it when no one was around, or at the very least, not brought it over to his house. Of course, if he did that, the story couldn't happen, so that'd be a problem for us. Maybe on some level, the sergeant actually wanted to spread the misery so he wasn't suffering alone. If it were me, I would have just given it to someone that I hated. Which, if I remember right, is how that Simpsons sketch about the monkey's paw ends. Of course, the Simpsons already did it. Anyway, the sergeant told Mr. White how to use the paw, then they sat down for dinner, and despite the rocky start, the night went pretty well. They go back to conversing about India, reminisce about the good old days, and by the end of the evening, everyone had mostly forgotten all that weirdness with the paw. However, when the sergeant left, the family's attention turned right back to it, and after some debate among them, 
Mr. White decided he was going to ask for some money. He didn't want to tempt fate though, so he didn't ask for a life-changing amount, only 200 pounds, which in modern day America bucks is roughly 25 grand but that was enough for him to pay off the last of his house loan and get him completely out of debt. When Mr. White made his wish, he felt the monkey's paw twitch in his hand. But curiously, that was the most exciting thing to happen that night. Money didn't magically appear in their house. No one knocked on the door to drop off a big bag of gold, nothing. At that point, it was getting late. So the family shrugged their shoulders and went to bed. But Mr. White had an eerie feeling that tomorrow was gonna be an eventful day. Before we move on to part two though, if you're looking for an amazing way to market your business, show off a passion project, or share your art with the world, then you won't need a monkey's paw to do it. You'll just need our sponsor, Squarespace. We've been partnering with Squarespace for years now because they truly are the best at what they do, giving creators, entrepreneurs, and go-getters the proper tools to build beautiful websites easily, efficiently, and affordably. From their nearly endless library of award-winning design templates to their intuitive interface that lets you drag and drop boxes however you please, Squarespace has all the answers for those looking to share their passions with the world and grow your businesses. They've made formerly cumbersome processes like buying a domain, creating galleries to show off artwork, listing products for sale, or collecting emails for community newsletters almost effortless. And because Squarespace knows how important a website is for success, they offer their users marketing tools and analytics so you can see how much traffic your site gets and which keywords to optimize for so you can market yourself more effectively and grow those numbers like you never thought possible. So whether you want to give your business a fresh new online identity or get professional with your passion, you can go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to start your completely free trial. And when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. When the White family woke up the next morning, there was nothing to indicate that the 200 pounds had arrived. In fact, somewhat ironically, Mrs. White found a large bill they had to pay in their mailbox. Herbert then left for work, leaving his parents to sit and talk about the previous night's events. Mr. White swears to his wife that whether or not the wish does come true, he definitely felt the monkey's paw move in his hand, but she refuses to believe him. Only their argument is cut short when she notices a well-dressed man pacing back and forth in front of their house. On his fourth pass by the front gate, he finally pushed it open and knocked on their door. The Whites welcomed the stranger into their house, hoping that he was there for wish-related reasons, but he was strangely silent for someone carrying good news, so they soon realized that couldn't be it. When the man finally introduced himself, he told them that he was from Ma and Megan's, the workplace of their son Herbert and he said that he had terrible news. Earlier that day, Herbert got caught in some machinery and was killed. Upon hearing this, both Mr. and Mrs. White go numb. As the man continued to explain what happened, they stood there in a state of shock and disbelief, barely registering his words. The man then says that Ma and Megan's accepted no responsibility for the son's death and had no legal requirement for compensation. But out of respect for their son's service, they will grant the couple a small sum, 200 pounds. Hearing this number sends them both into a frenzy. Mrs. White screams at the top of her lungs. Mr. White collapses to the floor. And that is how part two ends. When part three opens, Herbert has been buried and his parents have been grieving for the past 10 days. We learn that he was the last of their surviving children and their whole reason for being. So without him, their lives felt empty devoid of purpose. They now spent their days living aimlessly with nothing left to talk about or look forward to. For a little while, they remained hopeful that this nightmare was going to magically end one day and Herbert would surprise them by walking through that front door, but eventually the hopelessness of their situation became impossible to deny. One night, Mr. White wakes up to the sound of his <laughs> wife crying. So he sits up and sees her staring out the window as if she was waiting for some kind of miracle to bring her son back. Suddenly, a look of inspiration flashed across her face, and in an instant, she was on her feet. She wanted to know where the monkey's paw was so she could wish her son back to life. Now, Mr. White had already considered this possibility and confessed that to his wife, but he told her that it was a bad idea. He knew the paw was going to twist that wish into something evil, and to resurrect their son after his body had been rotting for 10 days would only bring pain and suffering to everyone involved. 
To make matters worse, Mr. White had actually seen his son's body, and while he didn't want to reveal this to his wife at the time, Herbert had been so mangled by the machinery that he was only identifiable through the clothes he was wearing. But all of these very reasonable fears only seemed to disgust Mrs. White and encourage her more. She shamed her husband for being afraid of their own son and told him to get the paw and when he refused her, she demanded it. Mr. White went downstairs and felt his way through the darkness to the fireplace mantel, where the paw had been sitting since he first used it. He was too afraid of what might happen if he were to make his wish alone in the living room, so he felt his way back up the staircase and returned to his wife. As his wife waited at the top of the staircase, the moon shone through the window and cast a pale white light on her face. She had a furious, expecting look in her eyes that her husband had never seen before and when she ordered him to make the wish, he couldn't refuse. Mr. White said the words, I wish my son was alive again, but like when he made his first wish, there was no indication that anything had changed except for the monkey's paw squirming in his hand. Then Mrs. White waited by the window until the hope in her heart was as diminished as the candle by her bedside, and she finally agreed to go to sleep. As the old couple lay in bed, listening to the sounds of the night and their own racing heartbeats, they found it difficult to fall back asleep, so Mr. White decided to go downstairs and get them another candle. Only when he gets to the bottom step, he hears a soft knock at the door almost like the one knocking wanted to keep the arrival a secret. Mr. White froze, unable to bring himself to open that door out of fear of what he would see on the other side. Then, another knock rang through the house, one that was loud enough for Mrs. White to hear. Mrs. White raced out the bedroom door as Mr. White rushed to meet her at the top of the stairs. He grabbed his wife's arm and asked what she was going to do, but she didn't bother to answer. Instead, she pulled away and called out to her son. As she sprinted down the stairs faster than she'd ever moved before, Mr. White felt around the bedroom floor, desperately looking for the monkey's paw. As he scrambled around on his hands and knees, he could hear his wife fumbling with the locks. She unlocks one, then another, and then cries out that she needs help reaching the one at the top of the door. Mr. White ignores her and continues his search, but he knows he's running out of time as he hears the frantic Mrs. White drag a chair across the floor for her to stand on. As the sound of her dismantling the lock echoes through the house, he finds it. Gripping the paw tightly in his hand, he makes his third and final wish. We never get to hear exactly what he wished for, but we're told that the knocking suddenly stopped. His wife whipped open the front door, excited to see her son once more, but to her disappointment, no one was there. She let out a long, sorrowful cry as if her last shred of happiness had left her body and she collapsed to the floor. But Mr. White was secretly relieved. She may never understand his reasons why, but he knew what he was protecting her from and had no regrets. So that is the story of The Monkey's Paw, but I've got more for you than just the story. So just sit tight and let's jump into the fucked up folklore that inspired this twisted tale. This may come as a shock to some, but the monkey's paw as a magical artifact was an original invention by W.W. Jacobs, and the story was not a reimagining of any pre-existing folklore or myth. That being said, while the events of the story are original, there have been a number of stories collected from countries all around the world where protagonists learn about the dangers of poorly thought out wishes and forcing fate with a particularly hilarious one coming from the 1001 Arabian Nights collection. I'm not talking about Aladdin either. Funnily enough, in his original tale, he has an unlimited number of wishes that he successfully uses to improve his life drastically. Sure, he gets into some trouble along the way, but he just uses more wishes to get out of it and live happily ever after. No, the story I'm referring to is called The Three Wishes, or The Man Who Longed to See the Night of Power. In it, a man is blessed by Allah with three prayers guaranteed to come true, and when you hear what he wishes for, you're gonna lose it. Following his wife's advice, the man's first wish is, wait for it, a giant wiener. Only this wish doesn't go as expected. Allah does bless him with a plus size package, but this thing is so huge he could have strapped wheels to it and traveled across the country. Naturally, his wife is terrified at the prospect of, how do I say this delicately, her front gate being obliterated by a battering ram.
So she makes her husband wish to be rid of the thing. But once again, he isn't specific enough with his wish, so his magic stick disappears, leaving him as smooth as a Ken doll down there. Obviously, this wouldn't do either, so the man's third wish was for his manhood to be restored to exactly as it was before. And the last line reads, Thus the man lost his three wishes by the lack of wit in the woman. Now let's be real, he can blame the woman all he wants, but it was his choice to actually make those wishes. And to the feminists watching, don't worry, there are other variants of this story where the husband is portrayed as the clear bad guy. In a Swedish variant called The Sausage, which is not a metaphor this time, a woman is granted three wishes by a divine stranger and uses the first one to wish for a big fat sausage so she can feed her husband when he gets home from work. Only when he finds out she wasted one of her wishes on a dumb old sausage, he gets pissed and wishes for the sausage to be stuck to her nose. Then, unable to remove it, they're forced to use their third wish to make it disappear, and they end up in the same sad situation they were before, as if the wishes never happened. The lesson here is obvious. I even stated it at the start of this episode. Be careful what you wish for. That's right, he can be taught. In the context of these stories, the danger is always hidden in how the wish was phrased. Mr. White wishing for 200 pounds, but not specifying how he should get it is what caused the death of his son. The husband from 1001 Nights wishing for a long schlong, but not specifying an exact measurement is why his trouser snake grew as big as the world serpent. But if you want an example from the real world where genies and monkey paws don't exist, Think of it this way, there's always going to be a downside to any good thing that happens to you. If your dream is to get rich and famous, be aware there's going to be thousands, potentially millions of people watching your every move and waiting to celebrate your downfall. That dream job you've always wanted might be in a city that's so far away that you're cut off entirely from your family and friends. That doesn't mean that you should overanalyze every single decision you make and end up with paralysis by analysis which happens to me far more often than I'd like to admit, but just be aware of the trade-offs because happily ever afters don't exist in the real world and the credits don't roll until your story ends. With that in mind, I have a fun question for you, mere mortals. If you were given a monkey's paw, what would your three wishes be? And how would you phrase them to avoid any unwanted side effects? Let me know in a comment down below. Then, if you enjoyed this episode, or at the very least learned something from it, sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to the algorithm gods to get more messed up folk tales and myths sent to your sub box every Thursday. I'll see you all again next week with the final installment of our annual Spoopathon. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.